the centre of this theory of mind is the conscience. So the principle of the conscience is very easy to explain and to understand. It is that if you commit a crime, steal some money that isn't yours, say, then the first time you do it, your conscience will whisper in your ear and say that was not the right thing to do, you should give the money back. The second time you do it, conscience will do the same thing. But if you ignore the conscience a second time, it will then not whisper in your ear anymore. And that fix is permanent. So a straightforward theory that goes consistently with what's gone before in a moral sense where perhaps there is a slight difference in this theory compared with what's gone before is that it's based more on pride than on humility. So the thesis, the philosophy of it is that you have a right to be proud of yourself and you have a duty as a responsibility as a result of that being allowed to be proud, which is not life at any cost. So part of one's responsibility is to choose the life one leads and also whether to lead a life at all. Where I would categorically disagree with other people is where I'm told that children are born sinful and have to acquire conscience. I don't think that's the case at all. I think children are born with a completely clear centre, centred conscience. This this becomes a bit more nuanced as we get further on, but for the sake of discussion, I'll leave it as a, as a, as a very simple, I'll leave it as its most simple at this point, so as to get it across. So children have the clearest conscience and intelligence is also something that comes with a duty. So if a person sells their intelligence off to a highest bidder, then that carries a price for the conscience. But most people, in spite of what, uh, in spite of what one might be told, most people have a native intelligence. Most, uh, most children and anybody with a clear conscience has a native intelligence, which is equivalent to anybody else's intelligence. It, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's no different to a genius level intelligence. It just doesn't have that focus, that direction, that training that, 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 that makes the genius stand out. Now, um, given that idea of the center being the conscience and then the outside being the personality, which is which is something to be proud of. We develop this according to the theory of parent, adult, child, which is how I refer to my three dimensions of personality. So over the next three episodes, we're going to specifically focus in next time, which is, this is the second episode, so that's going to be episode three. We're going to specifically look at the adult in comparison to the child and that will allow us later on to look at the other two possibilities so that we've covered all three possible possibilities. The adult child 
next time round when we talk about it will be will give us the opportunity to talk in terms of for instance the bicameral mind and to tie our thinking in with the very latest academic thinking and the very latest understanding so that's quite exciting The episode after that, we're going to talk about the adult parent, and there we're going to talk specifically about spirituality. And so that ties the theory across to our religious inherited knowledge and understanding, and specifically challenges the idea that, for instance, reincarnation is some kind of belief system. I think. So that, that will be perhaps more contentious, perhaps not. I think it's very simple. Uh, hopefully that will be very enjoyable. And then, that's episode four, and then in episode five we'll discuss the parent-child and we'll talk about some uh, We'll talk about what you might call the guru level. So if I was to suggest that um, this theory has general applicability, it's not, it doesn't, it, it, it uh, won't benefit from being my theory. I would just be one of a number of, um, I would just have my, my own particular expertise in a certain area of it, perhaps, um, and, and I would claim to be a guru, but just like many, many other people are uh, not, 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 are not pretending to be geniuses, but are clear that they have something to say to people in general. So that's episode five. And then finally, we've got the last episode, which is, um, taking a step away from all the new stuff and back onto safer ground in terms of me being a computer programmer and that episode being fundamentally about my experience of IT over my working life. Scientists are very interested in studying the brain at the moment. So there's a lot of talk about the different areas of the brain, a lot of experimentation about what different parts of the brain are responsible for, and a general curiosity. What there isn't so much of um, is either a curiosity about or an understanding of the mind as opposed to the brain. I'd like to <coughs> start then by introducing two uh, alternative ways of looking at the mind in the form of books. What I have is the book I've written and I have somebody else who has the same idea and has written their book. So this is by Spencer Grendon, a professional astrologer. He's realised that transactional analysis, the three dimensions of personality, map onto the old theory of astrology and he's thought aha that's really interesting i can use one to feed up i can use one to compare against the other and go back and forth between them and see how they cross fertilize so very much the same idea as as i had which is that well three dimensions of space correspond to three dimensions of personality i can do the same i can see how they cross fertilize so, what if you completely disagree with everything you've heard me say so far? What if you maybe partially agree, partially disagree, but are sceptical and want to approach it completely from the outside? Well, you could do worse than have a look at this book. 
it's the same idea from a completely different perspective. Let me show you what I mean. On page one, we have parent, adult, child mapped across to the three elements of astrology, the sun, the moon and the planets as represented by Saturn. Completely different to my idea, which is that the child maps to goodness, the adult maps to truth and the parent maps to chance or fate completely different. The opening sentence goes like this. Consciousness is a lot like juggling. The juggler is a mental magician deep within our psyche whose deft energy propels various visions before our inner eye. So this is the metaphor that Spencer Grantal uses throughout the book. It's that of a juggler juggling spheres. And these spheres are the three ego states, or as I call them, dimensions. He assumes we understand the metaphor without going into it in great depth. And I just want to clarify one aspect of the metaphor. I just want to pick up on this idea of what exactly the juggler is a metaphor of. What is it that we're all juggling, even on a day by day, minute, hour by hour, minute by minute basis, that is as difficult as what a juggler does? I think what we're juggling is contradictory beliefs. I think every single one of us goes through our day, our week, our year, our life, juggling multiple contradictory concepts. And it's that that is the art and the science of life. And I think we all do it, even though we may not fully realise we do. In other words, you do it when you're you do it with your friends, you do it with your family, you do it with people at work even, you do it in work. Now I'm not particularly interested in astrology myself, I don't know particularly about it, I'm not I haven't gone to the effort of knowing. I haven't been motivated to learn. So I'm not going to talk about astrology. I'm coming at it from a philosophical point of view. And to me, there's instantly a problem with The, the basis of, of astrology. The sun and the moon, you could argue, are equals. You could argue there's an equality there. Saturn is just one of the planets. Where's the equal? And it does say Saturn. It doesn't say as one of the many planets, it specifically says Saturn. So there's a logical anomaly, a logical discontinuity there, in that Saturn is no more an equal to the Sun and the Moon than Neptune, Uranus, Mars, Earth is. So I don't, I can't, that, that puts a barrier in front of me to go further into the subject. And there are other barriers that arise for somebody like me to explore the subject further. And that's why 
this is not a book I can talk, I can, I can comment a great deal about. It's not, it's not an approach I would use. I've, if I was trying to say, If I was trying to write a book where the metaphor was going to be a juggler and the juggler was juggling primarily three ego states and then what Spencer does very well is to take it to the next stage as well and to have two jugglers juggling six effectively balls between them. So in other words if you're in a relationship, which I'm not, then you would be juggling not just your own contradictory beliefs, but also those of your partner. You know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a double act. That's not the approach I would take to my version of this of this book. If I had started off with a juggler juggling three three balls, I think my uh, first area of curiosity would be how are those three balls different from each other? How do you how do you represent the difference between the parent, the adult and the child in three balls in a way that illuminates it in relation to the individual? So when I was thinking that, I was thinking, well, to me, those three balls are, require radically different juggling skills. You know how when you see a juggler, a professional juggler, they generally make it more difficult for themselves. So they juggle not just balls, everybody starts off juggling balls, but they juggle clubs spinning clubs much takes they juggle spinning clubs the next step on they juggle spinning clubs which are on fire and then they might start juggling actual sharp bladed clubs knives for example and i think I would like to see the metaphor developed along those lines. I'd like to suggest that if we're encompassing the range of juggling requirements, then I would say that the experience of juggling is akin to the experience of juggling a tennis ball, a bowling ball, and a sharp edged knife by its handle and I think the difficult so uh, so I think that that that's a more appealing description of the difficulty of what we're all trying to do and a more accurate one because I think that many of us have a great strength in a particular area we have a very we have a very spontaneous natural creative child for example our child is then the bowling ball in the three or we might have a uh, a very curious and perspicacious and incisive adult in which case it would be the adult who is the bowling ball or we might have um, a real passion for solving the problems of the world, but 
a tendency to take on the problems of the world, to, 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 to feel a great weight of the world's problems, and that would be the bowling ball, the parent. So, in the same way, the sharp-edged knife as the adult, well, we all know it's dangerous to run with knives. All computer programmers know that it's dangerous to run with knives. All computer programmers know that it's dangerous to run with scissors. Similarly, it's dangerous to juggle with a knife. Computer programmers are generally adult types. For, for child dominant types, then you might say, well, you're hot-headed, you're fiery, you're impetuous. So that would be the knife element of the of what's being juggled in that case. I'm getting enthusiastic about my own metaphor, but there's really no point because it's not in my book and it's not in this book. But I'm just illustrating how two different approaches could converge, but haven't. They are, they are parallel, parallel approaches. So if you want to form your completely your own opinion, then by all means, embrace what I, the, the one book that I discovered that's been written by somebody with the same idea as me, or whatever you can find, because skepti skepticism as we know is a great strength, and so is independence. So I welcome independent questioning. Let's come back to the idea of juggling three elements. They could be balls, they could be gear cogs, because cognition is how we navigate our waking conscious lives. Cognitive therapy is how we have a non-chemistry based approach to psychology. So we could be juggling three gear cogs that are parent, adult, child. We could also be juggling three bowling balls if we have great if we have a person who's got great strengths but also great problems, and I think Again, a lot of us would fit into that category. Then you're juggling the equivalent of three bowling balls. Now, <clears throat> what are some effective strategies which embrace, potentially embrace that model? One of the, one of the effective strategies which I've myself used and was described to me many years ago, and I recognised the appeal of it, is the, the jar of rocks metaphor. So it's an old story. How do you fill a limited size jar with rocks, sand, pebbles? because the danger is if you put the rocks in first and then the pebbles, there'll be no room for the sand because it'll be blocked by the, by the
blocked by the bigger items. So what you want to do is dribble the sand in, put a rock in, put a few pebbles on, no, dribble the sand in, drop a couple of pebbles in, put in a big rock, put some pebbles on it, more sand, and build it up that way. The the that's a method that one would arrive at purely by trial and error fairly quickly if one had great skills as well as great problems. So the question is, if you have too many rocks, too many pebbles, too much sand to go into your limited container, what's a way to, what's a way to, what's an effective way to navigate that situation throughout a life? I would propose to, to somebody with the particular problem I've outlined that what really matters is how many rocks are in the jar because it's the rocks that it's the rocks that count so how do you maximize the number of rocks in the jar i would suggest one way to do it would be to take the biggest rock out and deliberately put that to one side and then make the most with what's left what do I mean by the biggest rock? What I mean is the one you most want in there. So perhaps your biggest desire is to go to America, or perhaps your biggest desire is to get a first at Oxford, or perhaps your biggest desire is to marry and have children doesn't matter what the doesn't matter what what the desire actually is doesn't matter if it's very worthy or very unworthy all that matters is how much you want it if it's the thing you most want putting it to one side indefinitely is a great effort of self-control a great imposition on the self of willpower And I think I ended up doing something like that, which is why I ended up single and free to do what I've ended up doing. might say that sounds like quite a lonely you might say that sounds like quite a selfish life you might say that sounds like quite a lonely life but a life is just a life It's a long game. I'll try and illustrate that in a practical way by asking a rhetorical question. What's the difference between selflessness and unselfishness? It's a question that arises It's a question that carries more weight when we're considering it in the light of this parent-adult-child model for the human mind, when we're considering 
the child. If the child is the self, then what is the difference? Is there a difference? Is there a difference between being unselfish and selfless? Personally, I think it's quite interesting to consider that actually it's quite a big difference. To be unselfish is to give away the thing you want, to share it. To be selfless is to take the thing you don't want, accept the thing you don't want. It's the difference between not giving in to your inner self on, at that point in time and not developing a self to resist or give in to at a certain point in time. They're both completely legitimate approaches, both got strengths and weaknesses, and you can't do, you ha you, and at any point in time, you would need to do one or the other. Maybe it's helpful to think about it in those terms, maybe not. That's all I want to say about somebody who disagrees with everything I have said or I'm going to say. What I want to move on to next is the bicameral mind and the academic view of the mind. So that will be in, in the next episode. In the past, people have approached mental illness in what I would say was the correct way. They have built beautiful institutions to house what were described as guests rather than patients and designed them very carefully to be appealing whilst also being restraining to prevent guests from eloping rather than escaping. So a very different mindset, a very different approach to what you might normally consider this was at a time when people still believed that mental illness was the result of fate rather than anything else. Whether that is the case or not is a little bit irrelevant. The important thing is to respect the mental illness and to, and to have the fear of God about it. So whether whether one is um, viewing mental illness as a spectrum from Hannibal Lecter to, I don't know, to Napoleon. <coughs> Or the, or the three Jesuses, or whether one views mental illness as being a spectrum from depression to anxiety with schizophrenia somewhere, somewhere along the way. The important thing is to give it the space that it deserves and to recognise that a language 
to talk as equals is a valuable thing in its own right and we do not have that at the moment and that is what a, a, a theory of mind space offers. Let's talk about this, let's, let's extrapolate this theory as far as it will go. So we have said that Let me extrapolate this theory as far as I can take it at the moment. We've said that mind space is a three-dimensional space. And unlike external space, which I am inside looking out of, mind space, because I'm alive, I'm outside looking in on. Three dimensions, truth, chance or fate, and goodness. So now the, the obvious question to ask is, how does one move within this space? We know that one of the three dimensions is wholly subjective. Does that mean that, in fact, you can only move within two dimensions of this three-dimensional space? <clears throat> and it's important to understand that isn't necessarily different to the physical universe. The only reason we can move in three dimensions is because of gravity. And if you come outside of a gravitational field, which the galaxy is, then there are two questions that arise. One is, does that space even exist in a, in a meaningful sense? And <clears throat> what possible way could you have to move in it? In fact, I'm going to take you all the way with me by saying that it's the same it's the same difficulty here. I don't actually think you can move within this space. In other words, although one is born into the world and has a physical body with In other words, although one is born into the world and has a physical body which you can move around all over the world in, you can live wherever you want to for as long as you want to within the, within the birth-death timeline. But when you die, I think you go back to the underlying space that you came from and that is what gives gravitas importance significance and reality to a theory of more than one lifetime which if I did not have a robust theory of more than one lifetime I would feel I had nothing to offer beyond what you already have on offer from the existing teachings of the church, academia, uh, the roles that business supplies you and the, uh, the, the entertainment roles that Hollywood supplies you. That would be a complete description for me were it not for the fact that actually you can know all about these multiple lives. If you're, if you're, if you're curious, there's no belief system you have to have. There's no faith system you have to have. You just have to be curious enough to realise that these are real questions with real answers. 
So I think that family members are people who occupy a mind space that is in the units that I'm describing my, my, my mind space as having, they are next to you in those, in those units. I'll, I'll try and put that into a concrete, relatable context for you so that you can see um, the full context of what it is I'm, I'm really saying here. Now, I, I've lived with this theory for a long time, having, having, um, having had a book's worth of information to cogitate over for the last 15, 20 years. So I'm very familiar with the, with the fact that the dimension of goodness corresponds very naturally to the culture of women, whereas the dimension of truth corresponds very naturally to the dimension of masculinity. So masculinity versus femininity, there is no, one is not more powerful than the other, they are equals, just as these dimensions are equals. So I believe that gender fluidity reflects the fact that A, these are, these are fundamentally equal, and B, it is your choice as to whether you choose to see them as fundamentally equal. You have every right and every duty, possibly, to decide whether for you, in your world, with the people around you, goodness is actually the most powerful principle and the one that you commit to, or truth is the more powerful principle and the one you commit to. And I wonder, I'm, I am still wondering whether sex is a way to move in this space. I don't think the dimension of goodness allows any movement within it because that is 100% subjective. doesn't mean it's not real. It does mean you can't measure it. So there would be no way to, to move within it. The only dimension that you would be able to move in is the dimension of truth in relation to chance and fate. So I think that possibly sexual activity is a way for one particular sex to move within this mind space. I'm very much considering that as a possibility. I don't know, <clears throat> and I'm not really considering the possibility that both can move uh, or that neither can move. Well, I suppose I am considering the possibility that neither can move. Um, so those are the two possibilities I'm considering, that neither can move or that, or that one only can move. The theory of everything and everyone is a theory of everything and everyone at a certain level. So it's not a theory, it's not, it's not, it doesn't pretend to be more than it is. It's interesting, I think it's great and provides uh, many benefits, but it's a theory. It helps to have a, it helps to have
it's good to have a way to talk about these ideas. And so one of the things I considered is that you would, you would not talk about position in terms of this mind space. Therefore, what would you talk about? How would you relate to this mind space? And the word I've come up with is is this one. If, like me, you're a mature person, you might, you should, be familiar with the use of the, the modern use of the word appropriate. Over the course of my lifetime, it's become a very significant way to describe two types of behaviour. Appropriate behaviour and inappropriate behaviour. It's become a way to describe... It's, a, it's become a way to differentiate between what is entirely within the bounds of shared freedom and what is what is what what may be physically possible but is outside what we agree to be the bounds of shared freedom appropriate apposite so i'm suggesting proposing that one's position within the mind space is either apposite or not apposite. And that is, that is terminology that maps to appropriate, not appropriate. And so we would seek in our activities and our aspirations to be apposite and to understand our apposition. And that's in a situation where we cannot physically change our position, but we can. Whether you think of it as stretching, becoming very thin and very long in a particular dimension, or very short and very wide, or, or, or having a particular shape, however, however you want to think of it, or however whatever works for you is the way to think about it, it's this word. That I, that I think is a useful, a useful natural progression from, from, from the, the situation that we've already progressed into. So let's talk very briefly about truth. We have authorities who we expect and rely on for the truth. Academia, the church, the church's religion, business, politics. It's a shock to discover that these are factually incorrect because these are things we've been, we've been told through millennia. What are some examples? Well, for example, academia is extremely proud of its tradition of sceptical thought. I didn't realise when I was recording the video about laying out my philosophy, putting myself on the record, when I was talking about truth and presenting it in its ductile form. So the truth is bendable. It's flexible. You can twist it. It's, it's not a solid thing. Academia treats truth as being only important in its solid form. Every time you hack a piece off of this chunk of truth, it, it becomes a proof and you you accumulate as many proofs as you can possibly have. Well, the problem with that 
is that it becomes like a grain of sand and truth is not a truth is not a tower of sand truth is a line and skepticism is not the only approach to discovering truth and in fact my work has been based not on skepticism but on constructivism so i would say skepticism is not a negative it, it skepticism should not be ignored but it is a minor minor tool in the toolbox and a tool that has hitherto been overlooked is constructive thought which is where you start off from what would be the best possible belief to hold and is there is there any justification for holding that that belief so you can then work backwards from that to say oh well no that's a that's a um, that's a that's a, that doesn't hold up in the face of reality it's not actually that desirable that's because from a philosophical point of view we live in a a fairly we live in what's traditionally called the best of all possible worlds so from a philosophical point of view what is most true is also likely to be what is most desirable and if you've if you've posited the wrong thing as the most desirable thing you will that will be shown to you by comparing it against reality so that's a legitimate line of philosophical inquiry and it depends not on the removal of assumption but the replacement of assumption and the reason it does is because it is impossible not to assume anything and in fact philosophy as a subject has been going backwards under academic guidance under academic rules because it's only ever tried to remove assumption it's never tried to do anything with assumption and therefore this bendable ductile truth is a whole part of the line a whole area that has been completely excluded from discussion and discovery and hence somebody who isn't very clever can come along and do a, if they're willing to do a lot of work they can find out a lot of things for instance the church has a number of guidances it has some guidances on heaven it has some guidances on money on the truth the truth will set you free and it has some principles like the principle of original sin so all of these areas turn out to be flawed to the point of being wrong so children aren't born as original sinners children are born as as innocents and it's defending that innocence by living according to conscience and pride which is the best possible defense against losing that innocence or worse selling it the church says that heaven is a, a, a lovely garden full of sweets and treats. It's a child's view of heaven. In fact, heaven is a place that needs workers. And that's why you have a glorious destiny. Because you have a place in heaven which needs you to do your work. The truth will never ever set you free that is absolutely the opposite of what the truth is for imagination will set you free if you're in prison if you're locked up unfairly and you can let your imagination roam you can resist that unfairness but the truth is no help to you in doing that the truth the purpose of the truth is to hold you to the straight and narrow that is the fundamental purpose of the truth so when we talk about this ductile truth 
we're talking about something that can stretch and stretch and stretch and become a and become thinner and thinner and thinner and finer and finer and finer as long as it doesn't break because if it breaks then you're in free fall and there's no way back there's no guaranteed way back onto the straight and narrow as long as that as long as that thread of truth is held you can always reverse course follow it backwards and get back on straight and narrow Business and politics. So, right and left, we're told by politicians of all stripes, oh no, follow the middle ground. Don't be too far right, don't be too far left, follow the middle ground. I have to say, that's completely wrong. Because right and left are more like gender than they are abstract ideals. And with gender, you have a place for men and you have a place for women. And what you don't have is a place for people with both genders, people who are both sexes, and a place for people with neither sex. I appreciate people are allowed to be that, but the human race is never going to rely on those people. It's always going to rely on a combination of men and women so when somebody says oh we need that we need to we need to occupy the middle ground in order to have any chance of being elected the obvious question is well define it then define this middle ground tell me what principle you're holding to that both right and left can embrace for you to occupy that middle ground don't just tell me you're going to do some thing where you make it up as you go along because I have seen for myself that doesn't work and I don't believe it ever will work and I certainly don't think it ever has worked. Money. We live in a world where money, where we live in a world which does its absolute level best to tell us that money is a neutral thing. Money is just a is just a part of reality it's neither good nor bad it's how you it's how you use it it's what you do with it nothing could be more opposite to my experience my experience is that money is the opposite of neutral now i appreciate that it's an old old message money is the root of all evil i appreciate nobody wants to hear that today it's 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 discredited I'm afraid that's exactly what I think and I I furthermore think that not only is it not discredited I think it's never been taken seriously nobody's ever looked at that as a principle nobody's ever spent any effort on understanding why that is so maybe I'm wrong about that but what I, all I would say is put me to the test at the moment nobody thinks what I think and therefore I continue to think what I think if somebody else was interested enough to disagree at least there would be room for discussion at least there would be somewhere to go with it at the moment I'm left on my own so that's a quick review of some of the elements of truth that we're going to be talking about in much more depth I hope that's of interest to you. I hope it comes as a I hope it comes as a combination of um, a door opening and a light being switched on. In other words, I hope you realise that what I've said is a bit inarguable, and also that there is a way forward as a result of realising that. We'll see. Last time I was talking about film, this is the part of the video where I talk about something I love and this week I'm going to talk about comics. Try and keep it brief and to the point, but I've been a lifelong comics fan and I've taken a few from my collection 
so that I can talk about why they've had such a big impact on me and why I think they're, um, they're worthy of wider attention. I was 10 in 1970. All of these comics were published between 1960 and 1970. So as a teenager, I was reading these comics out of order and without context. And what I saw astounded me and I became fascinated. When I was 18, I did a project. When I was 18 and in, in college, we were allowed to choose a project. So I, <clears throat> the project I chose was American comics. And it was my first chance to identify what it was that I found so magnetic and so compelling about these. I don't feel I succeeded when I did that. And <clears throat> I probably hadn't succeeded at any point since, but I have expressed my love and and put it put it into a place where it is uh, where it is um, yeah I have expressed my love and I am content When I was 18, I had the chance to pick a project at school. So I picked comics to write about, to try and identify what it was that was so compelling and so addictive about these comics. As time's gone on, I've expressed that. In, I've found many forms, many ways to express that. And ultimately, I have written an essay which does go some way to So when I was 18, I, I wrote an essay. It didn't satisfy me and it certainly didn't um, exp It didn't satisfy me and I no longer have even, even a copy of that essay. Um, What fascinated me so much was the comparison between this magnificent, creative uh, starburst and phenomena like um, the Beatles or like uh, the television, what, you know, what, what I was seeing developing on the TV screen or in, or in cinema or in science fiction. It was equally as huge a discovery if not more so but it was completely secret nobody knew anything about it since then of course we've had superhero films which have um,
which had done for comics what the Harry Potter films probably didn't need to do in actual fact for Harry Potter. So now everybody knows about Batman and Superman and it's there's no uh, there's no difficulty in discussing the subject. In point of fact I did get that essay written and it is available from the website along with my other essays. So it's an essay about art. What fascinated me was the comparison between this art and the, the art with a capital A that people were talking about throughout my adulthood. So uh, people like Tracy Emin and um, Damien Hirst, um, Banksy, later on, uh, David Hockney, um, and obviously the, the great artists of the past. To my mind, what was being done creatively in the comics between 1960 and 1970 was the development of an art form in the same way the Beatles developed popular music into, a, into an, an art form that uh, arguably combined show music, show tunes, the power of show tunes with the, uh, with the visceral impact of uh, rock and roll and made possible Led Zeppelin in the 70s, Pink Floyd in the 70s, David Bowie in the 70s, they, they were all made possible by, by the artistic creativity of the Beatles. In the same way, a handful of artists working for the Marvel Comics Group under the editorship and leadership of Stan Lee between 1960 and 1970 set the template for a Shakespearean achievement which no one has come close to since and that's why I remain utterly fascinated although not blinded by the, the, the past not blinded because I've met as a as a as a um, as a creative self-expression myself of, of my own, I've found a way to express my feelings and my understanding and put it, put it into context. And I've completed that essay that I was trying to write and it's now available for people to read. And the essay makes a couple of, I think, astute observations about what was going on with the wisdom of hindsight. Now the first is similar to we were discussing film previously and pointing out that the archetypes of actors that I had written about 20-30 years ago were matched by a similar archetype of actors now and the example I was choosing was black actors as being a more interesting example than the current uh, than trying to compare the the Hollywood leading men of a hundred years ago with the Hollywood leading men of today that's not so interesting in a similar way it occurs to me that the archetypal artists of the comics I love correspond to the archetypes of classical artists in a way that is undeniably undeniable. So we have <coughs> we have four artists I've got examples of here. We have Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, 
Jean Colan and Neil Adams. Jack Kirby. And there are two examples here. Jack Kirby is a Michelangelo style artist. So tremendously good at drawing forceful battles, uh, powerful battle scenes, uh, complicated machinery, um, but also a, a true artist able to uh, engage with his own world so that the Fantastic Four comic book title is, in my opinion, probably the archetypal achievement of the Marvel Comics group over the, over the decade, 1960s to 1970. That's the, at one a month, so around 12 a year, that is approximately 100 plus issues. And the Fantastic Four is really a continuing story over that 100 issues. Now, without, without spoiling the end for you, it does ultimately express itself in a repetition. So it, it ends with a whimper rather than a bang to, 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 to dramatise it. That doesn't alter the achievement and we'll come back to why that was a we'll come back to a specific example of the achievement as well without getting too caught up in that now the comparison is gene colan who is a rembrandt type style artist in the sense that whereas ditko and kirby are both about line, colon is about light. So we have a tremendously organic appealing um, uh, art from colon, uh, which in many ways technically is far better than both Kirby and Ditko But where Kirby and Ditko really stand out is with the storytelling of their art, their ability to frame the story because they're true creatives. So so the emotional impact of reading a Kirby or a Ditko is at least as great as reading a colon, although the colon will always be the more visually appealing and the more, the more beautiful. Ditko, of course, is the creator not only of Doctor Strange, but also of Spider-Man. Co-creator, along with Stan Lee. We have in this early reprints around uh, issue 30 or so of Spider-Man, we have possibly one of the archetypal four pages ever put into print by the Marvel group in the 60s, where Spider-Man talks himself through this tremendous battle of willpower to ultimately triumph, of course, but what a saga. What a saga and what a high point. So issue 30 of Spider-Man, that's about a third of the way through the, dec through the decade. And Spider-Man isn't, a, in, in my opinion, isn't a hundred issues of a continuing story. So Spider-Man has phases, good, good, um, like Superman, like Batman, like Captain America. The 
the thing that is so appealing about Ditko's work in, com in, in comparison with and as well as uh, Kirby and Colons is that Ditko is the uh, Leonardo da Vinci of the group in the sense that his figures are so lithe, so organic. There are no muscle bound, uh, Y shaped um, extremes here. Uh, these are always human people. Ditko was one of the first, art first artists to draw the Hulk. And even, even then, you can see an organic, uh, rounded element to the figure, not <clears throat> uh, very muscled, but not muscled, not, um, not Michelangelo, uh, not, 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 not that chiseled muscle uh, that, that we're so familiar with. A, uh, a far more um, a, 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 a fantastically strong character, but with a huge element of pathos to it. And that's the thing about Ditko, is that you're reading a story about weak, fallible people. Puny Parker, as, as, he's, as he's referred to by his peers, and it's believable and a completely different entertainment to, to Kirby. And then, of course, we have the great Neil Adams. So Neil Adams is, well, it's hard to think of a comparison in, in, in archetypal terms, in, sorry, it's hard to think of a comparison in artistic terms because Adams really sets his own rules. He's got a fantastic line, but what is so, so great about him is the expressiveness of the characters he draws. So he's the ultimate Batman artist, no question about it, and able to work for both complex characters uh, produced by Marvel and uh, archetypal characters produced by DC. Adams was immediately recognised as a cover artist and drew cover after cover after cover for DC in particular, which allow him to express his uh, complete mastery of strong emotion. And that was the appeal for, for we teenagers at the time, because of course we're feeling strong emotion and comics help us to express it. So there's a PAC element to, and, and, it, and it refers to destiny in, in how these artists um, work. There's also a PC, PAC element in the overall appeal of what they've created. So in, my, in, in the essay that I wrote later on, in the final essay I wrote, uh, there's a breakdown of characters in terms of uh, teenagers. So the single So the only child, the middle child, the youngest child, the angry child, the clever child. The, you'll have to read the article, I'm not going to go into any more detail about, about it, but these archetypes are, they illustrate the appeal of something that had a something that uh, had a life of its own.
interestingly, when looking at the superhero films, much as I love film, no aspect of this has been successfully captured and expressed. The Avengers was, at the time of recording this video, at the time of recording this video, The Avengers was the most successful film product of the series of uh, superhero films and in the continuation of the comics beyond the 70s possibly the Avengers storyline Civil War was one of the most interesting elements of modern comics. There's a theory in transactional analysis as I developed it which is that in any group of people beyond a certain magnitude, let's say about 10, those people spending any time together will split up into two groups. They'll split up into a parent adult group and a parent child group. Civil war could be said to have applied that principle as a plot device to superheroes. So in some ways it's an adult theme for a, a, a teenage idea. Of interest maybe, but that doesn't overshadow by any means the achievement of what we can see with hindsight. In fact, one of the things that I notice as still a comics reader is that modern comics Modern comics are not art. What do I mean by that? Very contentious. I'm deliberately massively overstating the case. Modern comics are beautiful to look at, way, way beyond what was technically possible, let alone uh, realised in the early days. Phenomenal um, craft but no art. So modern comics that I see frequently, all too frequently, have art that is drawn from copies of photographs rather than the rich visual imagination that was so, so appealing. You know, somebody's visualization of another dimension or a robot army, or another world. These were absolutely food and drink to a, a teenage, a, a puny teenage nerd growing up. That's why these comics are so loved, because they, they were our saviours. It was that visual imagination which was absolutely the point of them and so a comic that is drawn from a reference photograph is a different thing you know that is that is that is a that is a that is a that is a storyboard and a storyboard is Is a, a storyboard is a crafted item, not an art, not an art item. Storyboards are typically used to sketch out a film, as I'm sure you know. 
films are dialogue based. So modern comics frequently become dialogue based. They are not a combination of dialogue and thought. Now this is kind of the point of the essay I ended up writing and it's kind of the point about what an art medium is for. One of the things that is unrealistic about Stan Lee's work is that Sp the famously wisecracking Spider-Man and other heroes hugely enjoyably is totally unrealistic when you're in the middle of a battle even e how can I put it when you're in the middle of a battle any kind of conflict no matter how broken up or spread out it is there isn't nearly enough time for the dialogue that has been put into these panels to be spoken. It's totally unrealistic. It's also totally plausible and therefore totally enjoyable. Now that's a light-hearted example but it's a serious point because comics have thought bubbles. So comics can tell you what a character is thinking not just what they're saying. And the key there is motivation. You know, on film, anything you see has to be expressed by non-verbal communication or verbal communication. It all has to be there on screen for you to be able to perceive it and therefore understand it, for you to get any idea of motivation. That's how it has to be. That isn't the case with comics. You're free from that with comics because of this ability to show you what a character is thinking. And my example, my ultimate example, is from the Fantastic Four extended story over a hundred issues. Because what is the driving force of this long story? The driving force, I suggest, is this character here. He's called The Thing, and, well, <clears throat> and the story arc is that, the story arc is whether he will be a good character or a bad character. So 80% of the time, 90% of the time, he's a good character. And the reason he's a good character is that even though he looks like a chunk of orange bricks, he looks like a monster and scares children. And even though he's a normal guy and wants to have a relationship and so on and so forth, he's a good guy because when he's tempted to feel sorry for himself for the situation he's in or get angry, like the angry child, or decide to take the law into his own hands, like the clever child, any time he's in that position, we see a thought bubble. And the thought bubble says, I better stop feeling sorry for myself, because that's not how a man behaves. Or something along those lines. It's paraphrased. It's genuine. It's, it's not done for effect. It's done because that's how the story is told. And that is what creates this tension throughout a hundred issues. You don't even realise it's a tension for the first 30 or so because it's not, it's not, because nothing happens other than the characters are introduced and the stories are told, the, the episodes are, are told. So you don't even know that's the story. It's only when you get halfway through 40 or 50 that you realise, ah, I see, that's where this has been going. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to have been 
able to have and to and to have been a part of. So I'm deeply grateful. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not deeply grateful. Um, I'm just uh, happy that um, that uh, <coughs> I was able to enjoy comics at the time as well as later.